Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for tuning in from across the country. I'm delighted to welcome you all today to today's USPTO Speaker Series event with Dr. Marion Rogers Croak. These events are truly special because they give us an opportunity to engage with inventors, learn their stories, and give a personal dimension to the work we do. We've been fortunate to have incredibly accomplished innovators share their struggles and triumphs, their inspirations, their dreams. Today's guest is no exception, and in fact, she was a trailblazer in a technology that we are using to communicate with right now, voice over internet protocol. In addition, when Hurricane Katrina struck New Orleans, Dr. Croak was inspired to create text to donate technology, which facilitates rapid receipt of donations via text. Dr. Croak is now Vice President of Engineering at Google, where her focus is on reliability engineering to improve the performance of Google systems and services. And she's a source of inspiration for many, including myself. I'm also proud to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Andre Nyanku, who will interview Dr. Croak. Dr. Yonku is Undersecretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and the Director of the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Before joining the USPTO, he was a partner at IRL and Manila in the great state of California where we both hail from and represented clients from across the innovation spectrum, including those associated with genetic testing, the internet, and TV broadcasting, among others. Like Dr. Croak and myself, Director Yonku is an engineer, and prior to becoming a lawyer, he worked at Hughes Aircraft in Los Angeles. His dedication to protecting and improving our IP system and defending American inventors is invaluable, especially during these challenging times, and I am honored to be serving alongside of him. Despite these challenges, we are proud to see how smoothly everyone at the USPTO has adapted to full-time telework. Our productivity is up as our patent filings for small and micro entities and trademark filings, which is an indication that entrepreneurs are looking forward to interesting, introducing new and perhaps life-changing innovations. We are glad that all of you can take a break away from your busy schedules to join us for a chat with Dr. Croak today. Please join me in a warm welcome for Director Yonku and Dr. Mary Croak. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Laura, for the kind introduction. Uh, good to see you once again, Dr. Croak. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. And um, I um, want to uh, uh, welcome everyone who's tuning in. I know uh, that when we first started uh, these uh, events uh, a couple of years ago when I first arrived, the initial impetus was to introduce our examiners, patent and trademark examiners and the rest of the PTO stuff to the amazing inventors and entrepreneurs who uh, come before us. Uh, but these events have grown and now we have opened them up to others in government and uh, to the public. And in particular, I'm especially excited that we often get students and children from across the United States to join, and today's no exception. Um, I know that we have students from across the United States, and I know that some of you have already prepared questions and send them in, and I will try to ask as a result fewer of my questions and ask some um, um, uh, of the of the questions that we have received from the public and especially the students. Uh, so just a bit of a warning, Dr. Croak, we have a very diverse audience from really highly trained, experienced uh, patent examiners um, uh, to students uh, all the way down to kindergarten mm -hmm. and uh, everything in between. Um, what's really amazing, though, is that here we are um, in the middle of a pandemic, normally we would have had you come here to the PTO, we'd have sat side by side and have this chat in front of a live audience, but we can't do that right now. And instead, as many other people are doing, we're doing this via video conferencing, which is remarkable that we're capable of doing this. And 
one of the big reasons we're capable of doing this is because of your work uh, with voice over IP or VoIP technology, uh, which enables in large part these types of communications. So let me just start. Maybe you can first, let me just start there. Maybe you can first describe briefly what is VoIP? What is VoIP over IP? Oh, sure. I'd be happy to. First of all, I want to thank you for um, the honor of being here with you in the interview. And I also want to just acknowledge the work that your office is doing in, in bringing these um, inventors to the general public and, and the, the immense work that your examiners have done. Um, I really appreciate it. They must have fantastic jobs and I would love to interview them one day. I would love to sit and just watch all the innovation coming in and decide what is worthy of being patented or not. Um, that's one of, must be one of the best jobs on the planet. So VoIP is really the um, ability for us to communicate with one another through sound waves. You know, like when we talk, our speech is like a, a wave. And let's see. In order for us to transmit that 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 type of sound over the internet, so when we when we talk to each other, we're making like a sound wave, and 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 prior to the um, use of packet technology, the whole wave used to be communicated across a telephone line. With the advent of the internet, which is mostly packet technology you could actually encapsulate, break up that sound wave into information bytes. Because a lot of times when we're speaking to each other, surprisingly, there's silence. There's a lot of, of, of signals, which is our words that we're communicating with each other. But then there's also periods of surprisingly long periods of silence. And that allows you to break up the sound wave into discrete packets that you can then encapsulate and send over um, an internet communication network. Um, so one, way, one way I think about this, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, is you take all the sound, and if you can imagine you, as you said, break it up, and you put it in little envelopes, and yeah. then you seal the envelope, you put it in the mailbox, and off it goes, and you do many of these envelopes and they go all over the United States and then they eventually end up at the destination point. And then somebody there, there's a little guy or a little gal at the end point that opens up the envelopes and then has to rearrange the packets in the order that they were transmitted. Exactly. And so you can think of the, the, our, the way that we're communicating as information and as data, you can turn it into data and the data has an address on it and an identifier with it and the order of it is known. And that, as you said, that's a brilliant way to describe it, is all encapsulated in envelopes. And it can go, it can take all different routes, you know, it doesn't all have to go in a continuous line. And then at the end point, it's all um, converged together again and we get the information that we're communicating. It's amazing. I still think of it as a miracle. You know, I still, even though I know how it works, it's still a miracle to me. So it's very complex technology, but uh, it's absolutely amazing that it works as well as it does. Um, what uh, what did you invent? I know you have, so Dr. Yes. Croak has over 200 patents, um, most or many of them in this area. Uh, what 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 I know that you have many inventions, but maybe you can pick one of the major ones and describe that a little bit. Sure. So there's a whole class of my patents that um, focus on creating better voice quality and quality of service over the internet and reliability over the internet for voice traffic. So by that I mean when we used to communicate over what was called the public um, telephone network, the PSTN, it was completely dedicated to voice communication. And it was just crystal clear. It had very, very high reliability, meaning whenever you picked up a phone, rarely did you get any type of noise or distortion or the service would go down. It was just tuned for voice communication. 
The internet was very different than that. The internet was just a lower layer kind of network, and it was mostly geared for the transmission of something that it didn't matter whether it was in real time or when it got there or if the information was, you know, distorted. Um, it, it was a, it was mostly store and forward, what you call almost like electronic mail. Voice is real time. You, you know, I make a sound, you make a sound back to me, and that's how we communicate. That takes a lot of effort. Um, to make sure that it's going to be reliable, to make sure that it's going to work. So when I first started working in this technology area, it didn't work. It didn't work. The voice would sound very distorted. Um, A lot of times the network would just fail. And the more traffic you would put on the network, meaning the more conversations, the worse it would become. Um, So a lot of the uh, the, uh, patents that I received we're all focused on creating more reliable and more scalable uh, communication using the internet and using uh, being able to transmit voice communication through it. That was a whole class. Um, yes. We saw a few minutes ago uh, of uh, an image of your patents. I don't think we need to put it back up again, but um, uh, that's just one of the many that you have in this area. But once an inventor, always an inventor, and uh, you didn't do just VoIP. I understand that you have an invention that has something to do with American Idol, or at least it started. Uh, you got an idea while you're watching American Idol. First of all, I probably should not ask, uh, it, you know, how, how often you watched American Idol and why. But um, uh, what is that all about? Yeah, so it's very interesting. As part of my job, I had to watch American Idol because even though it was on quite late at night, it was after work, um, we were a lot of American. I was responsible for the reliability of the operations of AT&T's voice network. And American Idol used AT&T's network in order for people to call an 800 number and vote on their favorite star. And it would be, especially towards the end of the season when there was a massive amount of voting, because you could vote as many times as you wanted, those networks would start failing and we would have to reroute traffic. This was the reliable network I was just talking about. But there was such a surge of traffic with people being so excited in terms of trying to get in as many votes as they, they possibly could for their favorite star that the networks would go down and we would have to reroute traffic. And it was a nightmare, a nightmare. So I would I would watch it, but I would also be on the phone the whole time trying to get the traffic rerouted. So, you know, quite cleverly, we came up with this idea that we would have to offload the traffic from the, from the reliable network onto something else. And we thought, well, why don't we just allow people to text and use what was called SMS, or it was a different signaling network, signaling system seven, and and let them text the, the, their votes into the network, and that would offload a lot of the calls. And so that was very clever, clever, it was fast, and the network started working much better. So if you fast forward, I think like American Idol started in 2002, and then if you fast forward a few years, I, I remember just being at home, watching that terrible tragedy that happened in New Orleans after uh, Hurricane Katrina. And if you can remember, we all thought everything was fine after the hurricane hit, you know, and for me, that meant the telephone networks were still up and running and, and we could see that people were fine. It looked as if the hurricane had really passed over, but then the dams broke and the levees broke and that's when the real tragedy started. And it was horrific to watch what was happening. And many people felt helpless and they wanted to help. And sitting there watching that, and this is how ideas often happen, like concepts. So you have to expose yourself to lots of new things all the time. I I thought, how can we get help to them quickly? And that's when I thought about the concept of using text to donate. And, and, and I, You know, it just took off after that, and there have been many iterations of it, and it's been enhanced by many others. 
and it allows you just to pick up your phone and you know receive a message and hit a button and because you have a billing relationship with the provider they can take care of all the back end methodology that needs to happen in order to get the money to the to the charity or the nonprofit it is it is really an amazing invention actually if you think about it and and um, uh, combining uh, charitable giving with modern technology. I've experienced that in past years going to charitable events and fundraisers. But I got to tell you, since the pandemic, there are a lot of these fundraising events online, just like this. And I've discovered that it's become even more important to be able to do it uh, through this type of technology, text to donate uh, when it's online. It makes it much, much easier. Well, uh, obviously, the American history is full of amazing inventors going back to the very founding of this country and the first patent that was issued in 1790. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and we've had great inventors like Thomas Edison, Elijah J. McCoy, the Wright brothers, I could keep going on and on. Um, and what we've done here at the USPTO is to create inventor cards uh, of some of the greatest inventors in American history. And they're like trading cards. You know, kind of you have baseball cards with players and you can trade them uh, with your friends and whatnot and collect them uh, until you get the whole deck. Uh, well, folks uh, should know that we have recently added one of these cards for Dr. Croak um, and um, uh, Travis, do you mind showing that please? Wow, that that's so special. Thank you so much. <laughs> so this is the way the card looks. It's um, it's like a you know, it's it fits in your hand. It's that size. That's the normal card. This is yours, Dr. Croak. I don't know if you've gotten some yet, but we've also made a ginormous poster. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even. We tried to figure out how to show it. It doesn't even fit in the <laughs> on the screen. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna find a way to get it to you. Uh, uh, this was you. just introduced. Um, let me, um, with that in mind, um, let me go to uh, some of the questions we received from some of the students, uh, actually. Um, uh, a school here in Bethesda, Maryland, the Washington Episcopal School, um, uh, there is Catherine Owen has a third grade STEM mm -hmm. entrepreneurship class. Wow. Third grade. They send many questions, but given everything we've already heard from you, let me just ask one of the questions from them. So this is a, again, third grade student. Dr. Croak, when did you first realize you wanted to be an inventor? Uh, thank you, Catherine, that's a great question. <clears throat> I think I was probably a little younger than you are, Catherine. I think you must be, if you're in third grade, probably eight or nine. And I was, I was still um, home, so I must have been about four or five. And um, I remember, I often tell this story about how my mother used to call my father when something would break, like, uh, you know, the, we would have a, a stopped up toilet or the, the electricity would go out. And, and then my father would call a plumber or electrician and, and they would come to our house. And I just was so fascinated with someone who could fix something that was broken. And you know, when you're little, having a stopped up um, sink or something is a big deal. You know, it, it seems very dramatic and, and, and like a, an emergency. And the fact that someone could come in and start fooling around with a pipe and I would follow them around and I liked the way that they smelled. And I, I just like, they seemed like heroes to me. And so I became very excited with the thought that I could maybe learn how to fix things. And 
that's kind of what took me off on this journey. And I feel like I've been doing that all my life. When my children were young, I would come home from work after taking care of these big networks. And they would always say, the microwave is broken, my printer is broken. And that's how I would spend my evenings is fooling around fixing things. And, you know, I get annoyed, but then I can't stop. And I, I just wanted to work well. So it's been a passion for a very long time. Um, another um, question from uh, the same third grade class is, um, how does it feel to have done so many important things in your career? And what advice do you have for kids uh, to follow in your path? Uh, what a nice question. Well, first of all, we all do important things, right? We all do. And some of us at some points in time get recognized for that and other times we don't. And so don't assume just because someone's getting a lot of recognition or awards that what they're doing is any more important than what you do every day. Um, there have been many periods in my life where I haven't gotten recognized. And in fact, I've been told that what I was thinking about was silly or I shouldn't do it or um, something needed to be changed about what I was doing. And I felt like unimportant, but it, I wasn't. You know, it was just that people didn't understand the value of what I was doing. So I would I would just say to you, it's very nice when you get recognized, but it's, you, you have to learn with you have to live with not being recognized and kind of kind of try to feel good no matter what. Like as long as you're using your mind and you're inventing and you're thinking of making the world a better place, take pleasure in that. And sometimes you're going to get rewarded for it. Sometimes you won't. Um, you talk a lot about the role of um, mentors and role models. Um, let me uh, let me ask um, about that. Um, all of us um, uh, adults, at least, uh, have had uh, role models and mentors of some sort. Um, talk a bit about the importance of that for uh, scientists, engineers, and in particular, inventors. Yes, um, I, I think I think mentors are incredibly important. They, you know, there was this one study where this was even with college students, where they had to list what they wanted to accomplish in life, and they had one set of students just go ahead and do that, and then one set actually read about someone that had done something quite spectacular, and then they compared the list of accomplishments, and the ones that had read about a person accomplishing something extraordinary, their own ambitions were much larger than what they hoped to accomplish. So just modeling, like having, realizing that, you know, you think that I'm somehow different than you and I'm not, I'm a person. I have failures and I have lots of failures, lots of weaknesses. So inventors are people. And if you can see that by having a close relationship or being able to read about someone who is an inventor, I think you will then understand you could be an inventor. And the other thing I would also point out that is with, with mentors, they don't actually have to be real. They can be fictional. You could read about, you know, some character that does something extraordinary, but if you can get it in your mind that maybe you could do that, I think that helps as well. So, and, and then you don't even have to have just one mentor. You can like certain parts of one person and parts of others and kind of put them all together in your mind as a, a model for what you would like to be like. So I think it just helps us to be able to be inspired by someone who's human and who, who, can somehow make what seems impossible possible. And so then you start to learn the world is not exactly a stable place, but needs to change, needs to be modified, and you're capable of doing that. Um, a concern I have um, with 
um, creating more inventors, which I think is really important for the United States to do, is to make sure that young folks have role models and mentors uh, close to them in their neighborhoods or folks they can relate to. Um, and um, I'm wondering uh, what more can we do to get more people like yourself, more engineers, successful inventors, scientists, and so on out there uh, to, uh, to uh, give more exposure to budding up and coming inventors to others who have succeeded. Kids nowadays have a lot of exposure to athletes and musicians. They're all over the internet, all over the television, which is fine and great. They're very successful at their trades. How can we replicate that uh, with, yeah, with inventors? Yeah. I love that idea. I've been thinking a lot about that. Um, as you know, I do work for Google and Google has um, given employees an opportunity to spend 20% of their time on something that's going to help the world and may not be directly related to Google's business. So think of that as like one day a week. And so, I, I mean, I would love to partner with you to see if we could like start some type of initiative because I know many of the people that I work with love to interact with children and, and, and people who are interested in STEM, but maybe either through some type of like video sessions or even physically once we're able to be physically present with each other again, we could work with the patent office and, and help to, uh, students to become more motivated and interested in STEM by seeing what we do. Yeah, that's great. I think that's exactly the right approach. I think uh, I've been talking about, you know, having a partnership uh, between um, industry companies like Google and many others um, academia, universities, uh, schools, and the like, and government offices such as ourselves and, and others. Um, I think that's a very good way to create a relevant network and amplify. What about you personally? Um, who, well, I'm sure you had many role models and mentors. Who, who, if you had to pick a couple, who would you say were the most influential in your life? It's so interesting. Definitely my father. My father was so interested in my education. Um, both of my parents were, but for some reason, I, I just took to my father because he was, uh, he, he, he was just very proud of me in, in things that I did and was very encouraging for me to go into science and I, I math and I appreciated that. As, as I've grown older, I, I don't know if this is going to sound strange, but I get a lot of inspiration from people who have gone through very, very difficult times and then gone on to do something that benefits the world. And um, a lot, a lot of times I've gotten inspiration from people that have survived like the Holocaust or wars and, and become very resilient and have Sometimes they just go on to live what we think of as normal lives, but that is an extraordinary thing to me. So, you know, the world can be a very, very difficult place for many people. And as they, you, you know, you have to develop skills somehow to survive some of the worst things in the world and go on. And I get inspiration from people who have done that. That's great. Um, let me, uh, on a related note, let me um, uh, go to a question from, uh, another question from a student. Uh, you obviously, before I go to the question, you, uh, you've been very successful um, and uh, accomplished quite a bit uh, in your life. Uh, here is a question from um, a STEM class at R.L. Turner High School outside of Dallas, Texas. Uh, one of the students asks, how did you keep going? And I'll add, how did you succeed when there weren't many black female colleagues to relate to in your STEM industry? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. I appreciate that question. So I think what you have to do is, you know, you can do multiple things in life and if, if, if what you're passionate about, 
you're not surrounded by people who are like yourselves in terms of their physical characteristics or their ethnic backgrounds or their cultural backgrounds, you need to kind of step out of that, you know, kind of step out of your skin and see what you do have in common with them. When I'm in a room with other engineers or other researchers or scientists, we're all alike. You know, we're all trying to solve a common problem. And you can forget about what people may look like, where they may come from. Now, those your identity on those issues are is important. And I wouldn't say forget about it forever. You know, do have other groups maybe that you can connect to that can give you that type of cultural support and nurturing that you need. But you don't necessarily have to have it in an endeavor all the time. You know, I hope that that we improve and progress in society so that all people will be able to to do the things that I've been fortunate enough to do. But it's not as lonely as you think because you tend to think like the other people that you're around. I I like engineers. Um I feel a very kindred spirit with them no matter what. Um let me uh uh, encourage folks who are watching and did not send questions already, please go ahead and send your questions uh, through the link. Uh, feel free to send them now and I'll ask my team to uh, please go ahead and put them on the screen as they come in. Uh, you can start doing that uh, now if you'd like. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you one question. You, you talked about the first patent, I think you said it was in 1798, did you say? 17, what? yes, 1790. 90. Do you know what that was? Yes. I, it, was, was for, it, was, it was for potash, potash. Which, which is which is a fertilizer, uh -huh. um, you know, and uh, so that was 1790. That was the first patent. And just two years ago, we issued patent number 10 million. Wow. And patent number 10 million was on LIDAR technology. So LIDAR is like radar, you know, yes. you're sent, uh, but with light. Yes. Uh, so you're bouncing light to uh, off of objects to find out how far they are or how fast they're moving and so on. And what I find is that these seminal patents, whether it's patent number one or, or a million or 10 million, they are reflective of the time. So if you think about the way what was important in the country when it was first founded in 1790, it was an agricultural economy to a large extent. Mm -hmm. So they were automatic, you know, they were, that was what it was about. Um, patent number three um, was to, uh, to an automated grain processing system. Um, so, uh, and here we are in, uh, in our age, you know, it's, you know, it's it's lidar technology, which is very reflective of, you know, technology of the day. It's used in self-driving vehicles and things like that. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I was looking back at my patents. Some, I, you know, you. It's been a while since I've looked at them, and when I was looking at them, I was thinking, that was amazing that this didn't exist. You know, because it's so well, many of the things are just so normal now. You wouldn't even think that they would be rare, and yet when you think. 20 years from now, what we'll be hopefully looking at does not exist today, right? It's probably going to be one of the students that is going to do something that will cause the world to work in some major way. Well, you know what? Um, uh, this is a great segue into another question. Here's a question from Chloe, an eighth grader from Apple Valley School, uh, from the Apple Valley School District outside of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Two questions, and they're related. Let me ask you the first one. Um, when you were our age, so again, eighth grader, so I guess, what, 14 or something, um, what did you think future technologies would be? Oh, that's a great, that's great. Uh, I think you're, you're more impressed with me than you should be. Because <laughs> goodness only knows what I was thinking in eighth grade. I'm sure I was not as good a student as you were. Um, you know, I did always want like the fact that like that to be able to carry a friend around with me. You know, I was a type of 
of child who would have a great day at school and then come home and get right on the telephone and talk to my best friend for another, you know, few hours. I'm sure the way people talk on the, on their, and their mobile phones. So I did ha always want this concept because I loved being outdoors as well. And like, well, how do I play, but still have my friend with me? So maybe there was like a little inkling in my mind about something that was mobile and that had some video presence to it, but nothing as sophisticated as what we have today with smartphones. But I had desires, like I always had desires to change things that I saw and to, you know, if I was annoyed about something, it's like, well, what could we do to make it better? Like right now, even the thing that I'm most, like just as a, an aside, like one of the things I'd like to see happen is I don't like wires. I don't like wires. I just think they're unattractive and I wish we could do something about them. And so I'm living for the day when someone can come up with, you know, enough creativity to figure out a workable power source so that we don't have to have all these flyers around our homes. I hope that happens in my lifetime. Yes, I'm actually sitting in my office right now. You can't see it, but it's full of wires. So I'm um, looking forward to developing that technology. Yes. Um, well, uh, this is from the same student um, uh, who is asking, where do you think technology is going now? But let me expand upon it, okay? Uh, and challenge uh, your, um, uh, your visions of the future. Uh, here we are in 2020. What do you think the world of technology will look at like let's say first in 2050, which is 30 years from now. So when this eighth grader will be about 45 years old. Yes, yeah, yeah that's amazing to think about. I could be alive, I could be alive. I'd be pretty old, but I could be alive. Um, so I think what you're going to see is a lot of things that we do now that involves human labor, will be hopefully eliminated and people can go on and do higher order things. And by that, I mean, there are certain tasks that we do like going shopping. Um, and I, I know that most of us go shopping online, but even that you still need people to pack the stuff, drive it to your house, blah, 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 blah. I think all I'm, I'm hoping that all of that will be automated. But at the same time that that comes to be, and I believe there, I believe there will be self-driving cars. I believe that a lot of the daily tasks that we do that do take up a lot of time will be done by automation and by software. But at the same time, because that, I do think that shift is going to come. I think it's extremely important that we start to retrain the labor force and that young people start to understand how to transition into a world like that so that everyone can be still fully employed or as many people that need to work can work um, and that we don't just eliminate jobs, but we create new ones. I think that's those two things have to go together. I think, well, just looking at the past history of uh, human development and technological development, um, folks very often are afraid that automation, further automation eliminates jobs. That's always been the case. Yes. But as we all, as we see, actually what happens is more and more people have jobs and are employed in these highly skilled, we can always do better. Um, but historically, at least, technology has enabled broader employment um, in more and in more interesting jobs. I have no reason to think that that would be different in the future. But you're right. We need to keep an eye on that. Yes. yes. Uh, let me ask you, since you're such, you're very, very much an expert of sending voice and audio over the internet. We obviously send video over the internet now, um, so we have video and audio communication. Obviously, will it come a time when we can send, perhaps, some other senses remotely? Might we be able to send? Let me just start with an easy one: smell. You know. I so that was, I think, one of my concepts in the patent that I got was the ability to do that. And I know people have experimented with different ways that you can do that. 
I do. I don't know how it will happen, but I do believe it will happen. I do believe it will happen. Okay. Here's a wild idea. I will not. Uh, I will take credit for this crazy question. Um, uh, what about sending thoughts? Oh, isn't that an interesting thought? Now, many people believe that we do that today. Like there's something that we do where people can actually read your thoughts and that, you know, they say that that communication is 80% nonverbal. So imagine if we trained, you know, computers to understand facial expressions and they could probably read them much more so than we can, right? Um, and, and you were able to at least intuit emotion, right? And, and there's some level of that that happens today, like in call centers, being able to, um, I, I remember one call center that this was years ago and there was a, 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 a application where a call center is when you call like say an 800 number and you're, you're a lot of people are calling call centers because you're upset about something. And, and usually the, the person that's answering the call is overwhelmed, you know, with a lot of calls, they're trying to help, but the person is so irate. So what we would do is we, we had like a, a, a system that could detect the, the level of rage, say, or anger that the person was having by the sounds that they were making, even by the length of silence between the words. Because when you're very angry, you're usually not very rapid in your speech. You'll be rapid and then a long pause, right? Because it's a lot of nonverbal information going on. And then they would then decide how to route the call and who to route the call to as a function of the emotional level that the person was experiencing. So a very, you know, empathetic yeah. call center agent would get the, the worst calls. Um, so yes, I do, I do believe that in some sense, you know, maybe not our, our deepest thoughts and maybe not the most complex thoughts, but at least some level of trying to understand how the person is, is actually feeling and what they're experiencing. Like, it, you know, and maybe they'll be able to do it more than we can. Yes, um, that's, that's amazing. And it's already happening, as you say. Um, let me uh, go back to a typical characteristic of invention and inventors. I talk to many inventors in, in my job and uh, one of the things that almost everybody says that is a critically important component of a successful inventor is not to be discouraged by failure because uh, you're always gonna fail most likely and you just need to get back up on your feet. Um, here's a question from the audience that just came in uh, from Darlene Ritchie. She says, she asks uh, of you, Dr. Krogh, have you ever felt challenged to the point that you weren't sure that you could continue in your work? Uh, did you continue anyway? Um, in, uh, in other words, did you ever have to try multiple times in order to achieve your goal, having failed along the way? Yeah, so I would say, um if, if you think about it, and I don't think about it always this way, but most of my life has been a series of failures. And I think any um, one in, in any scientific field or research field or trying to do something different and, and, and change things will tell you that. The thing is that after maybe the first hard failure, it stops feeling bad. You know, you may feel discouraged for a moment in time, but then you try to figure out what can you learn from that failure? Like science is so much failure, right? Most things fail. 80% of the time it's going to be failing, but you have to learn from it so that you then you can go on and figure out how to make it better. So there are things that are called prototypes and pilots, and that allows you to just gradually in a very incremental way, try out something and test something so that you don't do it all at once, but you're testing it and refining it as you go. And um, I think I, I often make the case that, you know, as you walk, you're going to fall, as you learn to walk as a child, you're falling a lot, right? 
And you're not saying that baby's failing, right? You're saying the baby's learning how to walk. And that's what a life of of bringing change is going to be like. You're, you're going to feel like you're not getting anywhere, but as long as you keep learning from it and refining it and refining it, then you're going to get it. And you just have to have someone around you sometimes that can help you understand that you're not failing. It's not you. You're learning and you're moving ahead. That is such a great analogy to learning how to walk. But what about um, just the process of invention itself? Uh, some people think about, gee, there is like a eureka moment or like the cartoon or the light bulb that goes uh, oh, uh, it goes on above your head all of a sudden, and there you have it, the fully formed idea ready to go. Is that really how it works? Uh, let me relate to this, the real question from Nathan Coronado, fifth grader from Happy Valley, Oregon, who asks you, how do you come up with your ideas? Oh, that's a great question. And, and to your point, maybe some people have eureka ideas. Sometimes I think I do, but usually they turn out to be wrong. It, instead, it's almost like a discipline. You can think of it as a switch. And start out by asking yourself why something is the way it is, especially if you're not happy with it. Like, why do we turn on a switch for lights? Ask yourself, keep asking yourself questions about why something is. And, and, and what you'll see is that there's a certain conventional way to do something. It's the status quo. But it's because someone and then a group of society decided that's the way it's going to be doesn't mean that it's always going to have to be that way. Um, things can change. Know that things can change. And then you can actually say to yourself, I'm going to think of something new once a week. You know, I'm going to think of a new idea, a new way of doing something once a week. And believe it or not, it's like a switch. If you start training yourself to do that, you can see that it will escalate. So by once a day, maybe a couple of times a day, You'll just think of something very creative and it's like turning your mind on because suddenly you realize the world is very elastic. You know, we can change it. Um, people have changed it. Everything that's here, you know, has been changed, maybe inspired by God, but it's, it's people that are making these things and making kind of the conventions about, well, we use the knife and fork. Maybe, 50 years from now, we will not be eating with knives and forks. It will be something completely different. And so, you know, if you can turn on your mind, turn on that switch, it's almost like a discipline about how to think out of the box, how to think of discovery. It's fun, too. It's a lot of fun. Um, let me change subjects a little bit, but it's, it's related. Um, a, a major... Uh, initiative we have from here from the USPTO and the Department of Commerce in general is to create more inventors. We have studies from the USPTO and others that show that innovation is concentrated in the United States. It's concentrated demographically and geographically. Um, how, uh, and, and this may be a very complex question, but maybe at a high level, how do we make more inventors like yourself? How do we, how do we enable uh, more inventors um, across the demographics and across the geography of the United States, even away from the traditional innovation ecocenters, Silicon Valley, you know, and so on? Yes, yeah, so, you know, the companies, corporations, especially corporations like Google, they, their culture is invention, right? And innovation. But I think to your point, and this is where I would love to, you know, work with you on and because I think to your point, invention can go on anywhere and innovation can happen anywhere if people realize that that's what they're capable of doing. And I, I think I don't think they lack for the creativity. I think they think of ideas, but they don't know what to do with them. You know, they don't have that big corporation behind them supporting them. And I think if people had more education about the patent process or, or about invention and had some way of connecting 
you know, what they're thinking in their heads with that process, it would be a wonderful thing. Um, uh, I'll come back to education in a second, but what about the corporations? Yes. Um, and what about do what about the corporate creating a culture of innovation? You used to work at Bell Labs. Yes. Uh, which no longer exists uh, as, as it used to. Um, you know, quite a few of the inventors on our inventor cards come from Bell Labs, not yes, just yes. yourself now, but uh, Jim West and and some others. Um, what was it about entities like that? What what was it in their culture that created so much innovation? Um, and it wasn't just Bell Labs; there were a number of those. Yes. Um, and 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 what can the modern corporations in today's world learn from them, and maybe reinstate somehow? Yeah. So thank you. That's a great question. And I, I you know, I did work at Bell Labs, and then that evolved, and then slowly died off. But now being in the Silicon Valley with with Google, I kind of see many of the same things where it's embedded within the culture and there's certain things that are important. One is that you're taught that your job is to challenge things, you know, to ask the why, like I just said. You're also taught to collaborate with each other because it's very atypical that you're going to have an invention all by yourself, but it usually comes as a result of some cross-functional teaming that you do. You know, we need to partner with each other. Um, some, some companies like Google, they're very intentional about creating spaces where people, physical spaces where people can come together and collaborate. Um, and then, most importantly, I think, and this even goes into schools, there's the, this concept of, as you were talking about failure before, like a blameless culture so that you're not punished for failure. You don't feel like um, everything has to be perfect or that you have to fit in. You're allowed to be different and you're allowed to fail as long as you understand what the failure was and then you can either build something or conceive of something so that others don't fail in the same way. I, th I think you know that you need to have that kind of safe environment and structure in place to encourage invention. Yeah, it's um, uh, it's such an interesting issue and such an important topic. Um, we're studying this issue, as I mentioned, at the USPTO. We've created just recently the National Council for Expanding American Innovation. If you go to our website at uspto.gov, you can see it and uh, take a look at our activities and also send suggestions um, uh, along these lines with what we can do to improve the culture of innovation across the demographics of the United States and across the geography. Um, uh, but it all starts with education. Um, and in my mind, uh, Obviously, we need to educate folks in science, technology, math, and so on, STEM subjects. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, what about, do you see a difference between that and then separate innovation or invention slash entrepreneurship education? A few of the schools that we got questions from right now uh, seem to have entrepreneurship programs going down to third grade. Um, do you see a role of that separate curriculum uh, of innovation on top of STEM subjects? I do. I think that's a really insightful question because you can learn science, you can learn math and just think, I have to learn what exists now, you know, or you can approach it with a sense of creativity. Well, this is what we know now. But what else is there? You know, what else can we do with it? And it's it's more of a mindset that you have. So I do think that there's a distinction between just going into STEM where you could just do it in more of a like a robotic way almost versus going into STEM with the notion of using it in an applied way to bring change. And, so yeah. there is... The, uh, I have a question from an educator from South Paul, uh, South St. Paul High School in Minnesota, Mike 
uh, Gelson, who asks along these lines, I guess he's teaching in this area. He says, um, uh, how can I best support invention teams, especially female teams, uh, as they invent solutions to community problems? Um, and again, he's in high school. Oh, I love that question because I love, I love that question because, you know, what we're experiencing today in the world is very much like the world that I grew up in. Um, I grew, I, you know, I grew up mostly in the in the '60s and the '70s, and the world was quite chaotic. You know, there was there was a lot of 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 change happening, and it was very clear that no one wanted the the world to stay the way it was. Everyone either said, "I want to go back to where it was." or we need to progress forward, almost exactly what you have today. So in some sense, it can be a very difficult world right now to live in, but it can also be very exciting because people are open to change. And I, I, I love the fact that that person is asking the question, how can you bring technology to help with things that need to change in society? And I think that will be like the next application. I was thinking how your examiners probably have a window into the future that no one else has because they can look and see what's coming. You know, patents are usually years ahead of when the actual invention will be ubiquitous, but it gives you an inkling of how people are thinking. And, and to think that we can bring technology to improve so society, I love that thought. Yeah, as I say to examiners here that uh, it's through our doors here, the USPTO, through our doors walks the future. Yeah. Um, uh, for the reasons that you've mentioned. Uh, so with uh, time winding down, let me uh, ask you um, uh, from a USPTO examiner uh, perspective, given that you're an inventor and you continue such important work, what is the role that you see for invention innovation in your own life of patents and the IP system? Yeah, so um, I have benefited a great deal from the patents that I've received. It's helped me just in, in terms of my own validation that what I was doing was you know, a good thing to do. It's helped me in my career. Um, it's opened doors for me that wouldn't have been opened. I, I deeply appreciate the whole patenting process and what it's done for me. And it, it's just been a tremendous benefit to me. And it, you know, I, I, I'm glad that, well, more importantly, I'm glad that the innovations serve the world. But then personally, I feel like I've benefited a great deal from the patents. And it, it, I can't thank the patent office enough for awarding them to me. Well, obviously they're all uh, fully merited and you have done and continue to do amazing work, Dr. Croak. Um, it's been an honor to have you uh, with us on this program. Your story is an inspiration. You are an inspiration to so many uh, uh, folks of all ages. Um, uh, inventors, entrepreneurs, and everybody else, including myself. Thank you so much for taking the time. Well, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate this. Bye, everybody. Goodbye.